Hi everyone, I'm Damien Brady and welcome to the DevOps Lab. I am joined today with a uh, good friend, John Daniel Trask, uh, who is CEO, owner, founder of Raygun. <laughs> the CEO and co-founder of Raygun. CEO, yeah. co-founder And everybody of tends to call me JD. Okay, so JD, <laughs> excellent. So we were, uh, we were having a conversation the other day uh, about DevOps and what it means in the context of you know, getting started in your business about you know, what stuff do we need to care about? And quite often it, people will stop at a couple of things. They will stop at automation where they can, you know, uh, they plan their work and then it automated all the way through to production, ideally. But then quite often development teams will stop and say it's in production now, that's good, the ticket's been moved from the left-hand column to the right-hand <laughs> column, where we're done, right? Yeah. And we were talking about closing that loop and yeah. how important that is. Yeah. Well, the way I, I tend to think about it, you know, I've been writing code for a long time, and uh, back in the day, um, you know, we would write our code, and you'd build it on your machine, and then you'd zip it up and paste it through remote desktop, uh -huh. and, and sometimes the clipboard support didn't work, which made it even more awkward, yep. you know, and then we started going, oh, what if we set up some sort of, you know, I think it was cruise control I used back in the day. I've used that build. one, yeah. Yep. And then uh, I think we moved to Octopus Deploy, you know, and we were like, hey, we can now automate the, the, the deployment, so mm -hmm. that was reliable. I've used that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then what we found was when we were building Raygun, we, we were talking about trying to provide the, the metrics and analysis on what's happening with the software once it's in production. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you say, when we were talking about it the other day, it's that closing the loop. We've managed to get to production in a reliable and repeatable manner. Now what we want is the intelligence to come back so that we, we can actually respond more quickly to what's happening in, in the real world with our software. And because we've already made these investments to get to production, our ability to iterate and improve the software really, really quickly um, really comes into its own once you have that, that full closed loop approach. Right. So I think it's kind of the, the last missing piece. Yeah, so one of the things we talk about, um, uh, especially in this uh, League of Extraordinary Cloud DevOps Advocates, the DevOps um, Cloud Developer Advocates yep. at Microsoft is um, delivering value on a continuous basis. Yep. But without knowing what uh, the users really want or how they're using the application or what the problems are in production, you don't really know that you're delivering value. This is true, this is true. So what we what we find as well, if it's interesting with uh, developers, mm -hmm. is that uh, we, we also ourselves are pretty loath to actually engage with, with people, like to, yeah. to be blunt, we kind of, we like to put on our Spotify <laughs> and you yeah, know, yeah. code away, right? Yeah, and the truth of the matter is, is that our users want to engage with us. We need to be thinking, why, why do we even write software, right? Like even when we say, oh, IoT stuff and it's a backend, so we, we write it for fellow human beings, right? Every piece of software written ultimately has a responsibility to people. Mm -hmm. and we need to think about those people and understand what is it they want, what is their experience, uh, you know, can we make it better and all of that. Mm -hmm. And there are elements where you can get that in a, um, sort of implicitly through these sorts of tools. And then obviously there's explicit things like customer success teams that talk with people, they run surveys, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we wanna try and make sure that people at least can get the automated feedback going on um, you know, through, because we can leverage tools to do that. Yeah, yeah. great. So um, it's, it's part of a couple of things, right? It's, it's monitoring what's happening in production, but then how users are using things. And, and part of the focus is on getting real data, not, not like pretend test scripts and all that <laughs> sort of stuff, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's always about trying to do the best you can um, before you get to production, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why we have staging and beta environments and things like that. We want to try and crush as many problems as we can before it gets there. But honestly, the biggest challenge you're gonna run into is that the breadth of different situations that exist uh, in the wild mm -hmm. is just so broad that you kind of have to end up where you're tracking that. You know, even, you know, I overheard uh, the conversation you were having with James previously, mm -hmm. you know, and about all the different device configurations, you know, and that's an attempt to try and cover, you know, a whole bunch of the breadth. And then you run into situations like, uh, you know, I've written software before where, we all get the works on my machine sort of, of situation. You yeah. know? And then you realize that actually the user is not kind of clicking this button, doing this thing. They're actually clicking the button, going to this page, coming back, going to this thing, then doing that. Mm -hmm. And because we're the experts in the software, we didn't even, oh, that's right, I forgot you could do that that way. And I don't set up the state properly. There's all these edge cases. Yeah. So, for example, Raygun, one of our products, is a crash reporting product. Yep. It reports on software errors across about 25 different programming languages. And the most amusing things to me that stand out, we have uh, thousands of organizations using this, is firstly, 
no one has ever wondered if the software works because they always get errors coming through. And secondly, every organization that puts it in immediately thinks, wow, 25,000 errors a month on the startup tier. Well, we, we, we would fit in that. And then they put it in and they go, holy moly, there's like six million errors a week coming out of it. Like, it it's amazing how much stuff can actually get through all of those layers mm -hmm. into production. And you know, as developers, we're pretty comfortable admitting you know, all software kind of has bugs, it's a reality of life. The downside is, is that a lot of people then use that as a psychological way to not deal with it. Right. You know, hey, well, it always has bugs, so it's not my fault. Actually, yeah, it kind of is. You, you, we were talking before as well about the idea of a QA team yep. um, and how in some cases, like, don't get me wrong, QA teams are um, particularly valuable. Yep. Um, they, they are list, especially for like um, exploratory testing and things like that. But you're saying that that can lead to some scenarios where the developers aren't thinking about quality at all, is that? Yeah, we, we've seen that a little bit in some teams where, especially from bigger orgs, where it's like, hey, I wrote the code, I throw it over the wall to QA, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I'll wait to see if it comes back. And if it comes back, sure, I'll fix it. And it's like, I, I don't believe in that attitude. I'm not saying we shouldn't have QA either. Um, mm -hmm. that some of these tools actually help QA people because they can be doing exploratory testing, something blows up, and the black box has already kind of captured the full context of what happened. So it's right. helping them out. Um, and then they can provide that context back uh, to the developer so they can fix things more, more quickly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this kind of like not my problem um, thing is, is quite pervasive, but I mm -hmm. do think it's changing. And I think it's being driven by the fact that companies like uh, you know, uh, Amazon, Google and stuff, it's like they don't, they don't tend to go down. They don't tend to have that many bugs, right? Yeah. I'm not saying they never have them, but they're actually showing people it is quite possible to write high quality software. Mm -hmm. And suddenly all of these other companies are going, ah, well, you know, maybe. Amazon's <laughs> eating our lunch, so we want to compete. Well, yep. maybe not blowing up the website, uh, you know, would, would be a good way to start uh, building customer trust. Yep. yep. So in, in your opinion, I guess, <laughs> your, your products are focused around making sure that stuff that people are using is working and giving you a visibility, I guess, yeah. into what's in production, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we talked a little bit about crash reporting. We also have uh, real user monitoring. So what that's doing is it's timing the uh, engagement that the actual customers have with your software. Okay. So you know, an example here is um, you, know, you write some software on your machine. You've probably got a pretty good machine feels like your software's fast. Yep. It's pretty difficult for you to understand what's the experience of a person using it on a five year out of date mobile phone on a <laughs> you know, 3G network while hiking in the trees, right? Like you don't yeah, understand sure. the distribution of the experience the user is having. Mm -hmm. um, and so real user monitoring is taking that data from what the user is experiencing. And one of the really interesting ways that, um, that we've seen this uh, being powerful to the team is that a lot of the time these days we focus a lot on server response times. Oh, yeah. my server came back to me in like 100 milliseconds. That's pretty quick, sub-second, yay. Yeah. We've collected, I don't know, probably like tens of billions of, of, for example, web sessions. And we support mobile for this too, but web sessions, um, we're, we're seeing this trend now where the servers are responding pretty quick, computers are pretty fast, a lot of the you know people can write pretty high performance back-end code. And the JavaScript is taking 5, 10, 15 seconds right. to actually initialize and then the browser to render it and all of that. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize is chewing up all of their time, right? Mm. They don't think about that. So measuring that uh, against the end user's machines is, is really important. It really opens your eyes and you kind of go, ah, oh, goodness, you know, our front-end engineers are about to become the absolute superstars of performance because right. Um, right now it's a bit... Bit iffy. <laughs> yeah. so, so how do you actually get started doing this? Like, what is, does it require huge changes to the software that you have to be able to monitor this stuff? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, bluntly, no. Uh, you know, I, I'm obviously a little bit biased here, but sure. in Raygun land, you know, yeah. my challenge to people is that we even say I think it takes less time than it takes to drink a cup of coffee. Right. Um, and I sometimes, you know, challenge people when oh, I didn't have time to set it up, and I'm like, well, if you if it takes you longer than 20 minutes, you know, I'll I'll send you something. Yeah. Um, because usually what it is is you're linking in an SDK, mm -hmm. you're initializing some sort of API key, very similar to say like a Google Analytics, mm -hmm. and then that SDK takes care of things like <clears throat> automatically hooking uh, unhandled exceptions. It's going to track the the user response times and all that. There's absolutely some advanced things you can do that may take a little longer, like deployment tracking. So comparing 
understanding performance between different deployments that you do, understanding yeah. bugs, which uh, deployments they were introduced in, even down to which commits actually introduced a bug right. uh, is possible. Some of those things might take an extra, I don't know, half an hour to get set up, but it's pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a general trend with uh, software anyway, is that you know the idea of having consultants come in and require six months to stand something up, Ain't yeah. nobody got time for that. Yeah, yeah. Because there's always the danger as well. If you think I'm going to have to rewrite a ton of oh, my yeah. code to be able to track any of this stuff. Yeah. And the other complaint, or not the complaint, but the other worry that people have, I think, is how, what the, what's this going to do to my performance? Yeah. Not that they know what their performance is like anyway <laughs> until they put it in, but you know, is this going to really slow down everything? Yeah, so that, that's also a really important question. Um, so firstly, like if you're thinking about crash reporting, typically the answer is uh, that there is no real overhead uh, when there's no errors, okay? Because it's like, hey, attach to some event handlers mm -hmm. and then wait for something to happen, okay? Then the software blows up and that SDK is going to burst into life and try and collect a bunch of information. Yep. So they're going to package it up and throw it over the wire to the service. Sure, if that's going to take a little bit of time, maybe, you know, few tens of milliseconds, to be blunt, you've already screwed up the user's day. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's an extra 10 milliseconds for you to now know that you screwed up the user's day? Yeah. So that's pretty lightweight. And then even on the performance side uh, with tracking that, we're quite fortunate that browsers these days, they, they have pretty modern APIs with a lot of these um, technologies built in for getting the performance timers. Mm -hmm. And so because they're already there, you know, you, you might load, and again, we support mobile, but we'll focus on web because it's, it's pretty popular, I hear. Um, <laughs> I think it's gonna take off. Yeah, yeah, but there's basically some static uh, properties in there that you can pull those off that the browser is already uh, storing for you. So as long as you are asynchronously loading the script, you know, which we default to doing, and then mm -hmm. when it's ready, it'll collect those and send them off, you're actually not really talking about much overhead. I mean, we already run on some pretty major websites. Um, Raygun's actually running on azure.com. Um, right. So, you know, there's been no real performance issues there from some pretty major customers. In fact, most people watching this probably run our scripts 10, 20, 30 times a day and don't even know it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So that's collecting the data. There's a couple of things. I, I was hoping you'd show me at least some of the stuff that, that can be uh, yep. surfaced by tools like Raygun. Yep. Um, I did wonder why you wanted me to bring the laptop in and hook it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you have the application. Um, what are we looking at here? Crash reporting? Yeah. So I'm logged into the Raygun uh, app itself, mm -hmm. so at raygun.com. And up here you've got the app switcher. So the idea here is, is that you've got all these different apps that you're tracking. They could be back end, front end, mobile, whatever. In this case, <clears throat> I'm just looking at a demonstration application. So this is all fake data. Right. Know, there's okay. nothing, nothing super secret in here. But what you're seeing here is for this application called website, here's my trend of errors over time. So you can see we're kind of floating around about 10 errors an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, I can, of course, choose to blow this out and see the trends over a longer time period. Uh, in this case, six months, we can see, hey, you know what, we must have done a bit of a buggy build there, and we can see the deployment bars, and we could drill in there. But that's, that's the high-level stuff. What we have down the bottom here is what we kind of think of as being our error inbox. So when errors are sent through to Raygun, we do an analysis on it. Mm -hmm. We will have a look at things like the stack trace, um, some of the other properties around it, and we'll try and group them together in a sane way because especially customers that are operating at scale, they don't want to get you know, a billion errors, right? Uh, they want to kind of say, what's my, what's my working set of bugs? So in this case, you can see here down the bottom, as far as Raygun is aware, in the last week there have been five unique bugs. Right. Okay. But they've occurred, if I was to add them up, probably about 1,200 times. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that in mind, maybe 1,000, um, you know, it's much more manageable to see that set. Now, some of the other things that you've got in here is that ability to resolve things. So obviously I can say I've resolved this. And this has two-way integration with tools like Jira. We also integrate with Visual Studio Online, things like that. I think it's VSTS now. Team so, services, yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things as well is also permanently ignore. This is oh. not to be like, hey, I just want to ignore my bugs, but <laughs> particularly if you're doing things like JavaScript, um, on the front end and you get things like weird extensions yep. doing stuff. You're basically a category of bugs where you can't fix the problem. Yeah. So you're like slowly training the system here to be like, hey, improve my signal to noise ratio. So I'm not getting bugged by things. And this integrates as well into things like Slack and Snapchat and all those sorts of things. So you can keep the whole team aware of what's going on. Yep. The thing that I really like about this is the user um, column here. And so you can sort on this, maybe we want to go, oh, 
uh, a longer time period. But what this is saying is how many actual users of our software were impacted by this bug. Right. Now this is important because if you think about it, we don't actually care how often an error occurs. We actually care how many human beings have we impacted with this software issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm always talking with customers about sorting on this column. You don't have to fix every bug immediately, you know, but maybe you want to build it into your sprint planning to say, hey, we're going to spend you know, one or two days a week picking off the top three or four bugs that are affecting the most users that we have. Yep. Right, so that, that makes it pretty smart. This way, we can see at a pretty high level what's the state of play around crashes. Um, but then when we drill into one of these, this is what you kind of get as a, as a user in the system. Now this is showing us this error for all time. So it's, effect, it's occurred 4,200 times, affecting mm -hmm. 380 people. We can see a trend. So the right hand side is all the aggregate information. Okay. And quite importantly here is we will also break down things like the machines and browsers. So we've had customers, for example, that said, our checkout is run by a cluster of 10 servers. Mm -hmm. You know, we put in Raygun and we immediately realized that only one server was actually ever causing these bugs. You know, right. and oh, there we go. Quickly, let's take that one out and just replace it and immediately it's fixed, which is pretty cool. In the middle, you've got the individual reports. So we can actually go through all of these if we so desired. Mm -hmm. Usually you don't have to, but you know you've got all the data here. So Raygun doesn't do any sampling. It actually collects everything up and then it generates the aggregate data in real time for you. So as a developer now, I can come in here and look at the summary tab, which is the things that I've picked that I want to be shown. Yep. I can go through some of these other uh, tabs here. So because this is a web error, here's the information that was collected there, any environment details that are available. We also let you store custom data. So tags are things that you can filter that front dashboard on. You can okay. even slice and dice this group. So if we wanted to just see the ones that were tagged with hidden feature, Custom data being um, any information. So some people like to attach maybe the last 10 lines of a log file or maybe the state of their React component at the time of error or right. whatever the heck they want, they can put it in here. Um, one thing we put in recently, which is pretty cool as well for the web, and it's in, I think it's just coming out for mobile at the moment, is the breadcrumbs. So what was happening in the lead up to when this error right. occurred. So you can see here, because this is a web application, we've got various events that have fired but we can see here that a call to an API actually failed just before the error occurred. So this is gonna give me as a developer much better insight into going, what the heck caused this problem, right? Yeah. We, I've spent days trying to diagnose a problem only to turn out that it's like a one line fix or a you know, check if it's not null before you do this, that sort of thing. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, we do have raw data in there. So some people say, hey, I'm sending stuff to a third party service. What mm -hmm. are we sending you? This is what you're sending us. Right. And all the providers are also open source, so our SDKs are all on GitHub. So that's pretty cool. The breadcrumbs are just a rotating log leading to when something goes wrong. Okay. But what we've done is because it's built on the same platform as the real user monitoring, if you've got both in there, we can actually then give you the entire user story that led to this error. So not just the recent events, but their entire navigation flow. Mm -hmm. And this also works well with mobile. We will automatically pick up the different screens the user's seeing and what they're doing that leads up to the point when they had the error. Right. So if even the recent events didn't make sense, you know, we talked earlier about that idea that sometimes users take a different journey on a function yep. than we think of. Yep. This is where you can see that. So you know, I jokingly like to say we've got breadcrumbs and we've got the full loaf of bread. So you can <laughs> see here that uh, in this case, it was a very short user session. They saw two pages were overlaying the load information versus viewing time, uh, and then when the error occurred uh, right. in there. So that's pretty cool. You might be wondering about these these names that you're seeing in here as well. Yeah, that looks like real users, are you? Yeah, so <laughs> firstly, as a reminder, this is all demo data, so these are not real people. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, what you can do is you can see things like this affected users. Um, this will actually, if you choose to opt into this, mm -hmm. you can see uh, who your users are. You have to tell us who they are, just to be clear. This is not spooky, weird Google stuff, right? right? And we yeah, don't yeah. do anything with this data other than provide it back to you. Okay. But I can see all the users that were impacted by this bug. So this mm -hmm. goes, you know, this idea that I could actually contact users when something is fixed. And we've had people, for example, uh, one customer, really large e-commerce site, they implemented Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. And they let their customers pay, and they did pay, and that was good, but there was a bug that they had that meant that even though they took the money, they didn't apply the purchase. Wow. 
But by using a tool like this, because they knew who their users were that were affected, they actually just exported this list to a CSV, gave it to the support team who just managed and applied all the purchases. Right. So the customer was actually none the wiser that there was even a software bug, <laughs> which I think is a, is a pretty cool story. Yeah, and yeah. then you can drill in on those users. And this is what you kind of get is this uh, profile for them. So we can see the sessions that they had. And this is where the sessions they're having, this goes to the RUM side of the world, real user monitoring. Mm -hmm. So we could drill into those and actually see what did the user do? What was their navigation flow? What was the load time? What was going on with this yep. to better understand, hey, maybe there's an issue with the performance of one of these pages. You know, what was the device they were using at the time? What errors? And we also support things like SPAs as well uh, in here. Oh, yeah. um, so you can kind of get a whole real view of what's going on. And so a lot of these tools that we're building for people, our thinking is this is the sort of stuff that your Amazons, your Googles, your Microsofts, and that invest a lot in building. Mm -hmm. um, they're not really available to the next 50,000 companies that don't have you know, a $100 million ops budget potentially. Yep. Yeah. Something like Raygun or any of the tools that Microsoft are building, you know, they allow people to start getting the same sort of capabilities to improve their software. You're already spending millions and millions of dollars building it. Mm -hmm. You're probably trying to make millions and millions of dollars off your customers using what you're building. Why wouldn't you try and understand what's going on with it? And yeah. that's, that's part of what we're trying to help with here in closing that loop. Great. So that was really cool. Um, I, I love the fact that we're focusing very much on the value delivered to the user here. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's less about, you know, we're catching the errors and we can blame, you know, Jeff in this department <laughs> for, the, for the exception, but yep. more that, you know, we're, we're discovering what the user is experiencing and making sure that we're delivering value when we, when we go and work out what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of the stuff as well are around DevOps, you, you know, Jeff, uh, as you mentioned there, yep. you know, like it's always it, that guy. We, we already know that we introduce mis mistakes, right? Software is very, very complex um, and therefore problems are going to occur. And this is not about, uh, you know, blaming people. Yep. It's about saying, hey, let's admit that these problems occur. Let's try and be uh, as front-footed as we can to see that they are occurring. Mm -hmm. Then let's try and make sure that Jeff gets enough information that he can fix it really, really quickly. And then we can also benefit from our existing investments in CI, CD, you know, so that Jeff can get his fix out pretty quick. Yep. And I'll tell you, to be honest, one of the cool things about being user-centric as well is that, you, you know, we get this already at Raygun because we track Raygun with Raygun, right. which is to say, somebody will contact us, this thing went wrong. Okay, let's go and have a look. So we actually just look them up by email address and, and Raygun itself and right. kind of go, oh yeah, I can see this issue that you had you know, 20 minutes ago. Oh, I know this person on the team works on that. File in the error report and they, you know, maybe they just haven't come in for the day to see it yet. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, cool. No, you know, I think the longest part of it's probably that it takes about 20 minutes for our build servers to, to build a new, new version, right. you know, and, and Jeff ships a fix. The thing that amazes people these days as well is if they, have a problem fixed and the company is actually really engaged with them around it, yeah. it blows their mind. You know, I always say, imagine the next time you're sitting there using Word and it says, you know, sorry, Word has to close, you know, and you, do you want to send a report? And everybody kind of goes, no, yeah. because why? Yeah. Imagine if it was like, yes, and then like, I don't know, the next week, the PM of their uh, Word team comes back and is like, you know, Hey Damien, really sorry about that issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. it turned out that uh, this was the problem. The latest patch is coming out. It's going to fix that. You'll never see it again. You know, yep. you go from being kind of annoyed to like, wow, wow that, yeah. these people care about me. Yeah, that's very cool. And yeah, like you said, a very important part of DevOps is that that kind of closed loop of this yeah. is what's happening and being engaged with with what the user is experiencing. Yeah, accountability um, and, and, and allowing the teams to get more done in less time. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Cool, thanks well, very much thanks, for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in. And um, keep watching uh, the DevOps Lab show. There'll be plenty more episodes soon. And thanks for joining us.